Today is January 17th, 2016. The title of today's sermon is The Day of Small Things. Turn to Zechariah chapter 4. If you're not quite sure where that is, start in Matthew and back up a few books. Zechariah chapter 4, and we're going to start in verse 1. When God speaks that much in a worship service, as a, as a person who is now going to share the word with you, um, I've studied and prepared for hours, and I am ready to throw it all out because He's already spoken to us, but neither am I discounting the hours that I've already prepared. So somewhere in here, just as much as the Lord has been leading us through a worship service, the Lord is going to lead us through this time. I, I felt that Pastor Matt did a great job at the end to try to turn it because it's been a little bit of a heavy service. But I think it gets heavy when the Lord of all creation is speaking something directly to you and we don't respond. It should be heavy. We shouldn't be able to ignore that easily as if His words don't matter to us. They matter to us. I heard the words and I had no inclination that they were at all something that, I, that was specifically addressing me, and I took time and said, Lord, when you speak, we should all listen. We should all measure our lives against what you say to us in any given moment, any scripture that we see. It's not for somebody else. I always presume that it's for me to start with. It may be for someone else as well, but I'm going to look at it and say, Lord, did you hear how many times the word cisterns were used? Did, did you hear that thought over and over again? It's fresh water, salt water? I'm bringing it up now not because it has any... Not because I had planned on it, but because the Lord was speaking to us so clearly. In Zechariah chapter 4, in verse 1, it says this. Then the angel who talked with me returned and wakened me. Say, wakened me. Wakened. As a man is awakened from his sleep. The word here, when you talk about waking, is to stir, is to agitate. It's to call to action, maybe even a call to arms. The implication here, and if you look at the, the metaphor that's used, then the angel who talked with me returned and, awake, and wakened me as a man is wakened from his sleep. I read this not as an implication that Zerubbabel was actually asleep, but that he was awake and still needed to be wakened. You ever done that? Somebody ever start talking to you and you're looking right at them and you're nodding and you're off somewhere else. I've learned to be more honest with my wife and when that happens, I'm like, I'm sorry. I drifted somewhere. I wasn't actually there. I missed the last 30 seconds. Can you just rewind it? Because I'm sure I'll be held accountable for that somewhere and I'll mess up something. So just tell me again. Right? Sometimes we're in the house of the Lord, but we need to be wakened. We need to be stirred. We need to be agitated. We are, we are, some of us try to get to an idea of let's get to fifth gear, let's get to cruise control because that's what life should be. The truth is, is most of us need to be more agitated than what we are, but we need to be agitated about the right things. Not as in frustration, not as in we're losing our cool because we are not in control of everything, but the truth is, is God needs to agitate us in the right way. What if God is agitated and mad at something? Can you then be passive and, and jolly? Not if the Lord's angry with it. Not if the Lord is correcting and rebuking you. We can't be, we need to be wakened in our soul. Verse 2. He asked me, what do you see? I answered, I see a solid gold lampstand with a bowl at the top and seven lights on it. All right, all of us, all the Bible scholars in the room, what kind of lampstand is this then? What would the Hebrew name be? A menorah. Exactly, that is the word in the Hebrew for lampstand there is menorah. With seven channels to the lights. Problem is, is this menorah is not a normal menorah. There is a bowl at the top. The seven lights we're used to, but with seven channels to the lights. There's a bowl on top, it's got tubes, it's got funnels, it's got channels from the bowl to each of the lights. Also, there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and the other on the left. I asked the angel who talked with me, what are these, my Lord? 
He answered, do you not know what these are? Hey, Lord, I'm not sure what this is. You don't know what this is? The implication is, is well, you're, you're, you're a leader in the tribe of Judah. He knew what a menorah was. He understood two olive trees. He understood the components of this thing. He's saying, do you not yada this? Do you not have an intimate knowledge of what this is supposed to be? When Zerubbabel's response is what? No. So he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. When you look at this, the word of the Lord. We studied this when we went through Genesis as a church. Our foundations class. The word in Hebrew is Debar Yahweh. The word of the Lord. Let's turn to Genesis 15. Hold your place here. We're going to come back to it. Turn to Genesis 15 and verse 1. Genesis 15, 1. Genesis 15, 1 says this. After this. Everybody say, after this. The word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. The reason we spent so long studying this is because that's really an interesting play of words. That's an interesting use of words. The word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Huh. Let's turn to Psalm 33. Psalm 33. Let's start in verse 4. Psalm 33, verse 4. For the word of the Lord, the Debar Yahweh, is right and true. He is faithful in all He does. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of His unfailing love. Can you say amen to that? By the word of the Lord, by the Debar Yahweh, were the heavens made. Their starry host, by the breadth, of his mouth without getting too far because this is far out of my field of expertise but one of my current favorite theories on the creation of the universe is the string theory I I find it very interesting as a believer the very very simple explanation is when you take and you go down we normally when I grew up you talked about the atom being one of the smallest parts of matter but it wasn't the smallest because in the atom you get the neutrons and the protons and the electrons. And science is saying, well, you can split those things. So when you start splitting those things, you get all kind of other things. And then the things that those split into, they can split those. And the things that split into those that split into those can be split again. And after a while, they get to all kind of weird names that aren't even the point. But one of the theories is that down at the smallest level, the very building block of everything is basically... Just a vibrating ribbon of energy. It's almost as if when we're looking at Genesis 1-1 and we see that the Spirit of God is hovering upon the faces of the waters and God says, let there be light. I'm a music teacher, so I realize that all music and all sound is just a bunch of vibrating stuff. So the idea that God could have spoken, that actually science is tripping around the idea that when God spoke and said, let there be, it is the very essence and building block of all that we see. That when he spoke, it caused energy to vibrate and say, yes, sir, we'll get to it. We will make light that has its own whole sets of properties that don't really follow anything else because it's just light and it does what it does. It's amazing. It's amazing. A simple example. Just trying to follow what the Lord is doing here. If I start running in a direction, and my son, who's younger and, you know, better looking than me, starts running, if I get to, I can get to 10 miles an hour, and, I, and, and he starts running away from me. 
at, at 12 miles an hour. You can start figuring out these distances and these times of actually how fast we are in relation to each other. You know what the problem with light is? Is if you turn around and you see a beam of light coming, and you can turn around and start running, it's always going to be chasing you at the exact same speed. It bends the very rules of the science that we think we all know. The whole world, this is what we know, Newtonian physics. You know what? Light doesn't follow those rules. You know why? Because when God said it, it's going to do exactly what he says for it to do. Amen. It has no other choice but to do that. Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 3. 1 Samuel Chapter 3. As I was studying this, I found another interesting place for Debar Yahweh. 1 Samuel chapter 3, and let's start in verse 1. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. (laughs) In our day, the word of the Lord is rare depending on where you are. It's interesting. There were not many visions. Verse 2, On one night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see. This is in a physical condition, but it's also a terrible thing when we are in a place where we start not being able to see the very things that God has prescribed out for us. He was lying down in his usual place. Verse 3, The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. Eli said, I did not call you. Go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. Again, the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. My son, Eli said, I did not call you. Go back and lie down. Have you ever been scared in the middle of the night when one of your kids comes in the room? I'm that guy. Like, I get all spooked, you know. Daddy, ah! Okay, all right, we're good. I had a bad dream. Oh, please, I'll take care of you now. Verse 7, Now Samuel did not know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel a third time, and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. Maybe you're here today, and the Lord has been talking to us all service, and it took you till near the end of that to realize that maybe God was talking to you. Amen. Amen. As long as you get it. So Eli told Samuel, go and lie down. And if he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there, calling as at other times. It's an interesting thing. The Lord came and stood there. Maybe he had been standing there before. But in this case, he stood there and said, Samuel, Samuel. It's an interesting, fun little study to see how many times and who God calls and uses their name twice. I think we covered that also on a Monday night, right? I believe it was seven people. Interesting. Then Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. The word there is really, when you look at it, it's Yahweh, would you debar me? Would you speak to me? Because I am now paying attention. These are the same words. The way I looked it up was I put in a little study program and put debar and Yahweh. And it pulled up this passage and I was like, what? This exact verse. Because he's actually asking Yahweh. He said, would you come and debar to me? Would you come and speak to me? It's one thing when God initiates it and says, Debar Yahweh, the word of the Lord came and spoke. In this case, I love it because Samuel went, Hey Lord, would you speak to me? Would you move upon my heart? Would you interact with what's going on? Turn back to Zechariah chapter 4. Verse 6, 
So he said to me, this is the Debar Yahweh to Zerubbabel. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. If you've been around in church, hopefully this is a familiar passage to you. You may not know where it was, you may not have known the address of it, but hopefully this is a familiar passage. Not by might. The word there is hayil. It means strength, your wealth, your army. One of the literal words that's used in this and oftentimes is army. It's not by might. It's not by my ability to influence the situation. It's not by my standing within society. It's not my corporate influence that this is going to be done. Nor is it by my power. My koa. The power or strength in which I possess. It's not going to be because of who I came from or what I own or what it looks like on the outside. Nor will it be from my own talents or abilities or understandings. But it's by the very ruach of the Lord. By the very Spirit of God. Now this is easy for us to say. Not by my, not, not by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. The truth is, is I think we have to fight this all of the time. To fight things in our own strength or in our own might. Verse 7, What are you, O mountain, O mighty mountain, before Zerubbabel? You will become level ground. Then he will bring out the capstone to shouts of, God bless it. God bless it. Um, this is a neat passage in Zechariah talking about Zerubbabel because it actually applies to Ezra. This same story right here, it applies in Ezra, it applies in Nehemiah, and it's actually talked about in Haggai. There are multiple books that tie into this very story here. Right? Let's take a look at Ezra chapter 3 and verse 10. Ezra chapter 3 and verse 10. Say there when you are there. So Ezra is one of the writings. It's prior to Psalms. To the Psalms. Ezra chapter 3 and starting in verse 10. So Zerubbabel is trying to rebuild the temple. He's trying to rebuild an actual temple here. And look at what it says in Ezra chapter 3 and verse 10. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestment with trumpets, and the Levites, the son of Asaph, with cymbals, took their places to praise the Lord and prescri- as prescribed by, king, by David, king of Israel. With praise and thanksgiving they sang to the Lord, He is good, His love to Israel endures forever. Amen. Yes, it does, by the way. All the people gave a great shout. Part of the story of Zerubbabel is he starts building the temple. And then he takes a hiatus. He takes a pause. He takes a break for years. Somewhere in the neighborhood of 16 years. He starts a work. And then things get difficult. And he literally leaves it. He leaves it. Can you hold your place there in Ezra? Because we're going to come back to that just for a second and go to Haggai chapter 1. Haggai is the book right before Zechariah, by the way. It's like a good old, what we used to call in children's church, a good old sword drill, right? Not a lot of the books that we typically, well, hopefully you're reading from all the books in the Bible. Hopefully you're very familiar with this, right? Haggai chapter 1 and verse 1. And it says this. In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month. This is after the years of a break. The word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Verse 2. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time has not yet come for the Lord's house to be built. Verse 3. 
Then the Debar Yahweh came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? There's an order of operations problem we have here. Right? There's, when you're in math, you have to learn there's a proper order of operations. It's not just left to right. It's left to right if all things are equal. Right? But there are other rules that start apply when things are getting more complex and you have to do certain things first or you will always come up with the wrong answer. Here he's saying, okay, so it's not time to build the Lord's house. It's not time to do the Lord's work, but you have enough time to go build your own paneled houses? Well, you know, it's just not really a good time for us. We just want to get our kids. We just want to get the job. We just want to get things in order. And then we'll really focus on the Lord. So it's not time to build the Lord's house, but you have enough time to build your own paneled houses, to build comfort in your own life. And then one day, far in the future, perhaps it's exactly like it is in Matthew when we see the example of the four different types of soil. Matthew 13, the four different types of soil. Well, one, what happens? The seed falls and it's just hard ground and it never pierces the ground. Nothing. There's another type that it falls on the ground. It falls into the soil and it starts to actually produce something. And what happens to that one? It's too rocky and the heat comes and toasts it, bakes it, kills it. The heat and the pressure of life, they didn't go deep enough with their roots and the pressure of life just totally destroys them. The third type of soil was the kind that falls in the ground, starts growing up, and it seems to be doing well, but other things grow up along with it, and they choke them out. One, the heat ends it. The other, it's literally the surrounding environment. It's to decide that we want to build our house instead of building his house. And then the fourth, the one out of the four that actually works is it falls on good soil. It grows up and it produces 30, 60, or 100 fold. And the truth is, as we know, that whatever had to happen there, (laughs) the pruning had to take place. We know through other scriptures there was enough to get the weeds out. There was enough to cut it back when it needed to be cut back. There was enough to be chastised when it needed to be chastised, and it caused real life and real growth to come forth. Turn back to Ezra 3. 10. <clears throat> when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments and with trumpets, and the Levites, the son of Asaph, with cymbals, took their place to praise the Lord as prescribed by David, king of Israel. With praise and thanksgiving, they sang to the Lord, He is good, His love to Israel endures forever. You know, this is a really interesting version. If you'll see this a lot of other times, and it's the children of Israel saying, he's good. Well, amen. And he says, his love endures forever. Getting a little bit more specific here. His love for Israel endures forever. Amen to both. All the people, everybody say all the people. people. Gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. Look at verse 12. But many. But. Terrible word. Terrible word when you're doing like this. Everybody shouted praise to God. But. Many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid while many others shouted for joy. Now wait, I thought the Bible just said that they all shouted for joy. And then we have many were lamenting because they remembered something that was former. They remembered something that they thought was better. What is the Lord doing here? Why Can the Lord possibly be doing this? And they lamented in their soul. They wept aloud. What does it say? Keep reading. So maybe it was just a few, right? No, it says many. Verse 13, no one could distinguish the sounds of the shouts of joy from the sounds of weeping. Whatever your favorite athletic event might be. Can you imagine a crowd large enough and you can't tell who's crying and who's cheering? 
No one could distinguish between the sound of the shouts of joy from the sound of weeping because the people made so much noise and the sound was heard far away. Have you ever walked up? I, I, I was, because of my involvement in marching bands as a marching band teacher, as a principal, I spent many years at lots of football games. Lots of baseball games, lots of basketball games, but lots of football games. When I was in college, I band nerd, traveled to many stadiums. It's, in, it's incredible when you walk up on a place that's got tens of thousands, 100,000 people, and they start cheering. It is deafening. It's one of my favorite parts about being drum major at LSU was I'd, we had our thing that we did before game, our pregame ritual, and I stood at the back of the end zone, and everybody got ready in this ripple kind of format, and then I started to walk out, and it took about four or five steps before the whole stadium can realize from the back of the end zone that I was starting to walk out, and they, this roar, so much so that the very first time I did it, we got all the way out on the field, and I have 300 members of a band behind me, college musicians, and I heard the first note that they played. This is awesome. This is great. All right, here's my thing. And I turned in this direction, and all I heard was, Mom! I was like, oh my God, I can't hear the band behind me. And I heard, Mom! It's like, oh my goodness. I, it, it, it frazzled my brain just for a second. I was like, I'm going to mess up in front of 100,000 people because I can't hear. 300 people behind me playing their guts out. I, I, I was not ready for the volume that came out of a stadium full of people aimed at us. No one could distinguish the sound of the shouts of joy from the sound of weeping because the people made so much noise and the sound was heard far away. Let's go back to Zechariah. Verse 7. What are you, or <clears throat> what are you, O mighty mountain? Before Zerubbabel, will be, uh, before Zerubbabel, you will become level ground. I was looking for this, and, and in my mind, I was anticipating it referencing O mighty mountain, something like the mountain of Zion or Mount Sinai. But really, as I was studying this, <laughs> it literally alludes to the monumental task that's in front of Zerubbabel to rebuild the temple to motivate the people. It's easy to lead people when, we're all, when we all agree on something. Husbands, it is easy to lead your family when everybody in your family agrees with what you're saying. All right, after you do your homework, everybody's going out for ice cream. Yeah, Dad, you're the best. I didn't say after homework. Okay, we didn't hear that part. We thought you said now. Not now. Can we do it now? Right? It's easy to lead when everybody agrees. If Zerubbabel has a place that have, you can't tell if people are cheering for you or crying because of you. I don't know if you've ever led a group of people. I don't know how many people you've ever led. It's a tough thing when there's so much of a crowd, you're not quite sure who's for you or who's against you. You're not quite sure that this is really going to work out because I feel like I'm doing what the Lord wants me to do, but I honestly can't tell because there's so much clamor there's so much noise that's out here, I can't quite tell who's for me and who's not. So when God is saying, what are you, O mighty mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you will become level ground. You will become level ground. God can pull down the high things and make them low, bring up the low things to make them high. The idea of level ground is that He has got His will laid out before you and you're supposed to just be able to run with a purpose. He's going to make it level ground. There are times when we have to climb up a mountain and do difficult things. We have to climb with our hands wide open, going, God, we're going to do this, and we're not really sure. And the Lord's promise to Zerubbabel is here is, really, when this is all said and done, you're going to look at it, and it's going to feel like it was a level ground to you. Whatever dips and turns 
and trips and, and, and falls that you had, I'm going to smooth this thing out because I am with you, because I'm telling you, because it's not about your strength. It's not about your might. As a matter of fact, most of us, the Lord has to spend our entire lives showing us that it's not about our goodness, that it's not about our strength. I think that's why when we read in the Bible and we see that God takes the weak and the wounded and the broken and does mighty things with them, you know why I think that is as a, as a general rule? It's because hopefully when they're weak and they're wounded and they're broken, they already understand, I don't have enough might. I don't have enough power. It's got to be by His Spirit. <laughs> I'm trying to remember how I used to say it, but, you know, hey, if, if you were... This was different groups before, but I was, you know, hey, man, if you're that 4.0, got everything going, seem to be able to do anything right, you know, it's okay. God may even be able to use you too. <laughs> Wait, what? Wouldn't, no, God, those are the ones that God chooses. No, those are the ones that man chooses because they look good on the outside. They seem to have an influence that, that would be beneficial to me. I mean, why wouldn't I want you in my group? Because you have... 5,000 Twitter followers. Oh, because it's strategic. So let's get you to be a part of what we're doing. It's not the way the Lord does it. He says, give me somebody who understands it's not by their might, it's not by their power, and I'll let my spirit radically be in them. I will let them impact everything they do and everywhere they go and everybody they talk to if they can finally figure out it's not about you. I've had a problem thinking that it was about me before in my life. And God has had to take me to places and go, really? Great. You go ahead and do it. Uh, No, 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 don't leave me. No, no. I don't need your strength. As a matter of fact, sometimes when I feel like I mess up the most, God is glorified the most. I'm never seeking to do things poorly, but when I'm seeking His will, even if I fall flat on my face, I feel like I can give Him glory. I don't need to be successful in what I do. I need to be obedient to what he says. If I seek success, am I not just seeking my own might? If I really just seek success, enough in the bank account. Enough, 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 enough. If I, am I not just trying to build my own might and my own power? Lord I, Lord, I will possess whatever you want me to possess, be it little or great. In my life, it's always been little. <laughs> School teacher. Yay! Great profession. Oh, look, once you go teach in a private school, which is like half of what everybody else makes. Yay! Thank you, Jesus. Now go be a pastor. Awesome! I got a pay cut. <laughs> From the not pay well to the not paid at all. Yay! <laughs> Glory! Thank you, Lord, that you're teaching me it's not about my might. Thank you, Lord, that I'm not bound to what I have or what I don't have because this is through your Spirit. I have infinite resources. I just got to figure out how to hear your word. I got to figure out how to listen to that Debar Yahweh so that I can operate properly from it. Amen. Before Zerubbabel, you become level ground. My father-in-law, whom I love dearly, I call him Pop because I never wanted to disrespect my father. I had a father until just a few years ago when he passed away. But I started calling my wife's dad Pop. I was trying to figure out how to honor him without dishonoring my father because I look at him as a father. He always says, we're doing something, it becomes a difficulty. His saying in a good old colloquial kind of way is, it's no hill for a stepper. There you go. Like, what does that mean? <laughs> it means it's not a problem if you just keep moving. Right. It's not a problem for somebody who's really, in this context, it's not a problem because it's not about your might or your power. Whatever before you is going to become like level ground. Then, then he will bring out the capstone. Everybody say capstone. capstone. You've got a cornerstone, and then you've got a capstone. Cornerstone is the thing that everything else is going to be aligned off of. Jesus Christ is both the cornerstone, the very foundation of what we're supposed to be doing, and the ultimate achievement of what we're doing. He is both the cornerstone and the capstone. Read in 1 Peter chapter 2. It talks about these things where we go, he's going to lay our foundation and make sure that it's perfectly square. You can measure off of this. This is what you're supposed to be doing. And he's also the crown of this foundation, of this building. 
So when it says, then he will bring out the capstone to shouts of what? God bless it. God bless it. God is encouraging him and saying, you know what? You got people with you and you're not quite sure where they are and what side. God's saying, I'm going to take care of that too. I can unify what's going on in your world as you're obedient because I'm going to make the level pass. I'm going to make the pass level for you. Look at verse 8. Then the Debar Yahweh came to me. The hands of Zerubbabel has, have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands will also complete it. What has the Lord given you to do? Are you like Zerubbabel and have taken a break on God's actual commands in your life? Have you taken a, a six-month hiatus? Have you taken a six-year hiatus? How about a 36-year hiatus in what God has called you to do? Have you taken a break? Have you decided that it was more important to build your house, your paneled houses, than to finish the work that the Lord actually has for you? Whether it's six days, six months, or 60 years, to presume that at some point God had called us and will really gave myself to that, and well, you know, then I just grew up. Then I just moved on, and that was a younger, more passionate time, and now I've become more reasonable about these things. Huh. Shame on you. The hands of Zerubbabel will have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands will also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord Almighty has come to you. Turn to Philippians chapter 1. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 1. Just a few more verses. Let's start in verse 3. Philippians 1, 3. I thank my God every time I remember you. I want people to be able to say that about me. Amen. Do you have friends like that? I mean, you just see them and you're like, oh, hey man. They're just a blessing. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this. Everybody say confident. The word that has come to our church over the last several services is that people were in despair. They were discouraged. And God said, stop being in despair. Be encouraged in the Lord. Be confident of this. Let your confidence arise that He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ. He who began the good work in you. The reason that we can be so encouraged is because he who promised is what? Faithful. This is not about your strength and your power and your might. This is about his ability to carry out what he said. I would rather fail. I was talking to Elder Steve earlier. I would rather fail in the kingdom while trying. I'd rather fall flat on my face, look like a fool, than to not try, than to just quit at what the Lord is doing. There are so many things, there are so many battles that you can win by just not giving up. Amen. By just letting patience have its work in you. By letting endurance be developed in you through the hard times. We said this before, it's amazing. Uh, someone asked me, hey, I've got this question about, about the Bible. Would you help me? No, oh, let's take a look at it. And we'll look at it and they'll have a great question. They're being very thoughtful. My answer most of the time is, keep reading. Not because I'm trying to be smart, Alec. I'm going, I've learned in my life, if I just keep reading a little bit, usually the word answers itself. If there's a question, it usually answers it. Maybe not in that passage, I'll find another one, and I'll just keep reading. And you go, oh, it says it right there. It just says it plainly. Well, amen. How about we not stop? How about we show some resilience in what we're doing? How about we not hit the first little roadblock and go, oh, I, guess, I guess the Lord doesn't love me anymore. Be confident of this. That He who began a good work in you will be faithful to see it completed. Yes. Yeah, but, but it's been two years now. I don't care. With all due deference to you, I do not care. <coughs> Did He say it or not? If it takes two months, two years, 20 years, 200 years, I don't have to even be alive for him to accomplish his word about my life. 
Maybe I'm like Elisha. Ask for twice as many miracles. And however you do the miracles between Elijah and Elisha, he's one short until he actually dies and is buried. Well, God, I guess God was wrong. Until somebody threw some bones in an old dug-up grave that happened to have Elisha's bones in it, and the man was resurrected. Amen. Oh, you, you might think that God's going to come up one short. You may blame Him that He has come up one thing short in your life. And I, how can I trust Him? You can trust Him because He's faithful. Be confident of this. Yes. Not be, have it in the back of your mind somewhere. Be confident that he who began a good work in you, did he begin the good work or not? Yes. Well, that's the, serious, that's the real question to answer. Because if that is a yes, then the rest of it, Amen. we're just going to stay. We're just going to stick around. Yeah. I chased my wife for a long time until she caught me. I chased her for a long time. She was a prize. She is a prize. Until she caught me. You know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to keep chasing the Lord until He catches me. I'm just going to keep going forward and believing His Word even though time may start lying to me. But all time does is get me to doubt my own might and my own power, which is a good thing. If you let the doubting of your own strength stop you detour you, choke out the promise of God in you. What a simple roadblock to get tripped up by. Are we not made of more than that? We're made of the very substance of heaven. What can we not do with His presence with us? I'm just not going to give up. I may feel terrible. I've said this before. Every pastor wants to, you know, most pastors want to quit on Monday. <laughs> Why? Because they got beat to shreds on Sunday. They didn't feel like they did a good job. There's discouragement that sets in. How many times do you see mighty men of God move in the Bible? And then what happens right after that? They're like, <laughs> Elijah calls fire down from heaven. That's awesome. The next passage, he's whining like a baby. But Lord, they're going to come and kill me. Seriously, you just called fire down from heaven, man. I know, but that was yesterday. <laughs> and because I was in the presence of God and I felt His Spirit so powerful, sometimes it reminds me how small my own power and my own might are. And I get discouraged. Fine. Un- have a good understanding of what your own power and might are. But remember, it's about Him. Closing this up. Then you will know the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. There's so many things that I didn't cover today. The Lord Almighty there is Yahweh Saba. The Lord of hosts. It's not about your might or the army that you think you possess. It's about the Lord of hosts. The Lord Almighty. The one who stands bold and organizes us as if we were a military unit. That is what Lord Almighty is. That is the original version of this. You can look that up in Exodus 6, Psalm 24, Psalm 46, Psalm 83, and realize that the Lord of hosts, (laughs) pardon my common vernacular, (laughs) he's a bad dude. (laughs) And I don't mean to be disrespectful of the Lord. I'm trying to say he is powerful. (laughs) He's nothing to be trifled with. Who despises the day of small things? Have you despised the day that you're in because you feel like it's small? Have you despised what the Lord of all creation has done in your life because you view it as small? Um, Chris, you shared a verse in Isaiah, was it 49? Let's turn to Isaiah 49. And as we wrap it up here in just a second. Isaiah 49 and verse 5. Says this. And now Yahweh says, He who formed me in the womb to be his servant. What did he formed him in the womb to do? Wait a minute. You mean God's got a purpose for us? You mean God has got a specific plan for us? 
to bring Jacob back to him and to gather Israel to himself. For I am honored in the eyes of Yahweh, and my God has been my strength. He says, is it too small a thing for you to be my servant? Is it too small a thing for you to be my servant? Um, Do you not like your purpose? I was formed for this in the womb, to be a servant. Is it too small of a thing for you to actually do that? Do, you, do we need more recognition? Do we need more encouragement in our own might, in our own power? To restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring my salvations to the end of the earth. Turn back to Zechariah as we finish up. Who despises the day of small things? Proverbs 1 says that a fool despises instruction. A fool. If people are trying to instruct you and you ignore them, you just blatantly say that they can't possibly be right, shame on you. The Bible says that you're acting foolishly. When a pastor, when an elder, when someone who's experienced in the Lord comes and sees something in you and speaks a word to you, don't be a fool. Don't despise what they say. Don't be quick to dismiss the very Debar Yahweh, the very word of the Lord in your life because you become a fool. How do we not despise the day of small things? We've got to hear the word of the Lord. We've got to get the Debar Yahweh to be at work in our lives. We've got to not rely on our strength or our power, but only His Spirit. Now, how does that impact us? As we remember all of the things that God does, how He uses the small. He actually prefers the small things. He actually prefers the weak and the powerless. Those things that are not noble. He chooses those things. He chooses a boy with five loaves and two fish. He chooses a boy with a sling and five stones. He chooses Moses as a baby in a basket in the Nile River. That's the kind of God that we have as He chooses those things. You know why? Because He doesn't need our mind. He doesn't need our power. He's going to do it because it's by His Spirit. We must remain faithful to the Word that He has. Let me encourage you. It's not by might. It's not by power. But it's by His Spirit. says Yahweh Saba. Don't despise where you are. Don't despise what God is saying to you. Don't get all bent out of shape because it's taken, <laughs> it's taken five minutes longer than you thought it should. Why, why are they promoted before me? With all due respect, shut up. I love you. Shut it. Because you're not doing yourself any good. You're actually fighting to keep your own might and your own power. It's counterproductive to what the Lord does. The Lord resists the proud, but what does He do? He gives grace to the humble. Those who say, I'd rather not do it on my own strength, even if I have it. I love being at this church. I can't can't express to you. I love having Matt and Eric as my brothers. I love having their families connected to my family. I called Eric the other day. We were trying to decide on something. I said, Eric, by the way, I feel extremely comfortable making this decision. I'm very clear on what I think. And I love having brothers to make sure that we get this right when I'm not relying on my own strength. I love it. I welcome it. I don't try to prove myself to these guys just to go, hey, man, I have nothing. So whatever I have, I'm going to lay it before the Lord. He'll make our paths level. So the things that we can't figure out right now, if we keep pursuing Him and we get His Word, it'll make it, it'll make it plain to us. Amen. It'll make it clear to us our path. If you don't have clarity in your path, perhaps it's because you don't have God's Word in you yet. Perhaps you need to find out and let Him speak to you because today He's been speaking to us. Amen? Amen. Would you stand to your feet with me?